For me, it still states a practice session. Hector, I don't know if that needs to disappear. Oh, uh, no, no, I'm going to click. I'm going to start the webinar now. Just oh, sorry, right, okay, yeah. that's fine. That's fine. Well, okay, so just prepare yourself. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Here you go, we have started. We're gonna see um, participants start joining the session. Hello everyone, welcome. We are just gonna um, uh, wait just a couple of minutes uh, to let everyone join in um, on the conversation. So stay tuned. Whilst we wait, I just wanted to say I hope everyone's having a really blessed day today. And I know that everyone's probably very busy in terms of working, but I hope everyone takes some time to like be mindful about themselves and their week. Um, that's really it for me. Awesome. A great message from Patricia. <laughs> Awesome. So I'm guessing uh, we're going to let um, um, people kind of join so I can start um, introducing myself and everyone on uh, on the webinar just later on. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in into LGBT Greats uh, Women Supporting Women um, webinar webinar emphasis on LGBTQ plus women in, in the workplace. Um, um, today, we're going to have for um, for amazing um, speakers that will be sharing their lived experiences, advice, and recommendation on how women can support each other, of course, no matter their sexuality or uh, gender. Um, um, share, share the next slide. There you go. Um, um, I'm going to introduce myself first. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm Hector Bastillos. I'm the marketing and branding manager at LGBT Grade. Um, um, today, we'll be joining um, um, Patricia um, just um, below. Uh, she will be helping us with the insights and content um, section part of this webinar to let you know more about the importance of Listen Visibility Week and the importance of LGBTQ plus role models in the workplace. Um, Shreyas, next slide. Um, so for today's webinar's objectives, of course, by the topic of the of the webinar, women supporting women, um, we first want to um, tackle the importance of the visibility um, day of today, which is Lesbian Visibility Day. Um, we would like to talk about and explore the obstacles that LGBTQ plus women are facing in the workplace and why it is important, you know, for women to support each other and allies as well. Um, the third would be to maybe we can build some common foundation on how to promote positivity and women empowerment in the workplace. And then hopefully, lastly, any takeaways on how allies can, can help empower uh, women in the workplace and in their personal lives as well. Next slide. And woohoo. So for you guys that are not familiar um, with us, we are LGBT Great. We're, uh, we're an LGBTQ plus membership community that focuses on financial um, um, services. Um, we are based in the um, UK and we focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion with the lens on LGBTQ plus issues and challenges. Next slide. Our vision and our purpose is to make every financial service company LGBTQ plus friendly. I believe it's a very obtainable goal, you know, and, and all of us can help just a little bit just by learning and being curious about the LGBT plus, LGBTQ plus community. Um, pretty much our purpose for this type of webinar is to create opportunities and uplift each other, you know, to create different resources for the community, people that are curious. Um, uh, we are here to provide those resources. Um, our organization focuses on EDA training, webinars, and um, statistics and, and, and reports. Next slide, Tris. Uh, we have over 50 members uh, across the globe. Yes, we are that cool, you know, and um, we are always looking to help any other organization that is starting from 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 a very 
early stages all the way to an enterprise. If you want advice or knowledge on equity, diversity, and inclusion, we are here for you. And then we are, I'm gonna pass it to uh, Patricia to talk about um, Lesbian Visibility Week and then her perspective on why role models, LGBTQ plus role models, women especially are, are important. Patricia. Thank you, Hector. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for diving into this webinar. I do think that this topic is very important because um, showing visibility for LGBTQ plus women in the workplace is extremely important. Um, so first, I just want to tell um, let us let everyone know um, why and how did L Lesbian Visibility Week come about. So for this year, Lesbian Visibility Week runs from Monday, April 24th to Sunday, April 30th. In my opinion, I feel like it should be longer, but it's okay. I'm grateful for the week that we have. Um, so Lesbian Visibility Week started in nine, from 1990 to 1992, um, between those two years in West Hollywood. So Lesbian Visibility Week was celebrated annually due to built up frustration with men in the LGBTQ plus community gaining a lot more visibility than women. We truly want to increase the awareness and boost the social political capital of LGBTQ plus women around the world. Um, I know that we've come a long way, but there's still improvements to be made when it comes to quality and equity for LGBTQ plus women. Um, so LGBTQ plus women get paid twice as less as um, LGBTQ plus women get paid half as less than gay men. They receive more microaggressions than we feel, and they, sorry, they, re they receive more microaggressions and they feel twice as less likely to speak about personal lives um, in their workplace. So that could include their personal relationships. Um, I know that I've had some very uncomfortable conversations regarding my sexuality when I mentioned that I am a lesbian within the workplace. So I feel more reserves when it comes to my personal relationships. I know that sadly, a lot of lesbians can relate, um, especially if you are the only or one of the only lesbians at work. Um, in terms of role models, uh, um, as well as not being the only representations in the workplace, it's just as important to have role models too. Um, a role model is someone that you, you look up to um, for imitations. The traditional picture of a role model doesn't really tell the whole story and misses a crucial element of identity affirmation, which is essential for LGBTQ plus individuals. So according to LGBT Great's report on role, um, role models for LGBTQ plus individuals, um, visible role models are motivational because they are a, a reminder of achievable success despite their identities. So around 78% of LGBTQ plus individuals agree that imitation of role models is a lot likely when they demonstrate technical and specialist knowledge. So um, role models also play a key role for identity affirmation within the workplace. Um, I can definitely agree with the findings of this report. I think that all of our panelists, actually I know that all of our panelists are great examples of role models within the financial services. They are at senior levels and have surpassed all of the challenges to be faced as LGBTQ plus women within the industry. So I'm going to be passing the mic on to Hector, who will introduce our role models um, in the panelists and also speak a little bit about the definition of role models. Awesome. Thank you very much, Patricia, uh, for, for that very insightful uh, intro. Um, we just want to share with you our definition of what a role model is. So for us at LGBT Grade, a role model is someone who plays a motivational role in how another person views success and possibility. It's an example of great, both general and specific behaviors, and and or someone who affirms another's intersectional identity by bringing themselves authentically and quite a mindful, the next word, you, you equivocally, I said that wrong, but I'm sure you can read. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Awesome, so we are about to start, well, we're, we're going to start the conversation um, um, about women supporting uh, women. So I'm going to introduce uh, 
not going to talk, but I'm going to let the speakers introduce themselves. Um, and I'm going to um, let Emma start first. Oh, great. Thank you, Hector. Um, hello, everybody. My name's Emma Custin. I'm a director here at Global Butterflies. We are a trans and non-binary inclusion consultancy for workplaces. I'm a trans woman or woman with trans history. Uh, my corporate background is 30 years experience in financial services as HR director. Awesome. Farah? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So my name is Farah Buzida. I am a global head of uh, solution and analytics research within the investment team in HSBC Asset Management. And I'm also the co-lead, uh, co-chair of the uh, LGBT DNI, uh, I would say, work stream initiative within HSBC. I am very happy to be here in this conversation today with you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Pauline? Hi everyone, I'm Pauline Lucas, Senior Advisor Services Manager at MG Wealth Advice. I also co-chair the Pride Network within MG. Uh, very excited about today's conversation. I think there's going to be lots shared and, and some really interesting insights as well. So thank you. Awesome. And then uh, we have um, Orla. Hi, <clears throat> um, I'm Orla Thielen. I'm the Global Head of Data Governance for Fidelity International. Um, I've been in the financial services industry since college. Um, so a lot of experience, I won't give away my age, um, but really excited to be here today and, and part of this conversation as well. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I mean, um, let's start um, um, with you, Orla. So what, what inspired you to join this webinar today and why do you feel this conversation matters? I think... In, the the team reached out to me internally and like I track I track our, our forum internally. We have you know the LGBTQ plus forum um and asked me if I would be a panelist today. And you know, I was like, yes, definitely. Um, because you know, being a being a woman, being a gay woman, um, and in the role I'm in today, you know, there there has been various challenges that you know I've had had to overcome in my career. Um and you're bringing attention to this conversation for people for women coming up in in the ranks and for for people to have someone to identify with you know i think it's so important today you know seeing the likes of who we are here today on on the panel you know having that person to identify with really helps um because you know like 20 years ago going back you wouldn't necessarily have that person. You wouldn't have that visibility. And I think, you know, that's why these conversations are so important in, in terms of how we support each other and creating that awareness, right? Yes, I mean, it's all about increasing the visibility and here is what all of you are doing. So, I mean, definitely, I really look up to women like you willing to increase that awareness. And uh, thank you for that. I'll, I'll go next with Farah. Yeah, um, well, to me, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, if there is one topic in, in life that I can really discuss for hours without stopping, and this could both really be the audience, is about uh, feminist questions and, uh, and intersectional uh, inequalities. Uh, and I really think that uh, uh, women supporting women in the context of LGBTQI is really first a feminist question, the way I would see it. Uh, now, about the importance of having this conversation I think, look, today we are uh, celebrating the Lesbian Visibility uh, Week, uh, and I think holding space for these uh, conversations is such important as a way to honor, uh, celebrate uh, the, our predecessors who did the work of uh, fighting for our uh, rights uh, and for all the LGBT community, but generally for all people, uh, human beings uh, uh, really defending and uh, fighting for uh, human rights, because this question is first a human right. And I think uh, it's our duty, I feel myself a privilege, to uh, to be here today to have the opportunity to speak about this topic and to perpetuate uh, to some extent uh, the the work and legacy of all our predecessors who did the work in terms of uh, fighting for our rights and i'm really glad to be in this conversation today awesome you know i i am definitely with you it's all about you know the people before us to leave the legacy for us to continue that you know because you know if someone started i think we need to continue it and 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 i 100 agree with that um, um i'm gonna go with pauline 
thank you. I, I really love um, what Farah just said there about duty. I really think that's a really interesting point because we have as women um, and as LGBTQ plus women, especially, we, we've all faced very similar challenges. So there's no such thing as a monolithic experience as a woman um, or a lesbian. However, we do feel we do face very similar challenges. We could all share stories that would resonate and that you know we could you know, we, we would agree with. And I think that that duty piece is helping others not only through the challenges, but an education as to how do we avoid that? How do we how do we stop this happening again and again as people come into our industry? That you know we talk about why we're here. Well, shocking reading is that from an FCA perspective, only seventeen percent. Of their authorized representatives are women 17 percent that is crazy so we're representing half of the population with 17 percent as authorized individuals so that so that's why um and yeah that that duty piece that you know, were very fortunate we're very fortunate probably all to have great role models and to to, to be that to be that mentor to be that representative it's, it's a privilege and i think we can open this conversation up across across panelists but really keen to hear from the audience as well so i think there'll be some some interesting insights thanks Pauline. and yes uh, audience feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar and then um emma what's your take oh yes please do ask questions i love questions um i would totally agree with everybody else this is a real honor and privilege to have this conversation and as a trans woman to be included in this conversation to feel safe and supported in a conversation is really, really important that we have this conversation. This is about lived experience. And as Pauline said, there's not one experience, there's multiple experiences. And by learning about others' experiences, that for me is a really great conversation to have. Um, there's a lot externally about trans and non-binary issues, but within our workplaces, it's, it's about how do we make it really inclusive and a supportive conversation. So really excited today about the conversation and all the questions that we're going to get. Yeah, no, awesome. Thank you. Well, I mean, um, may maybe um, how do we make that space more inclusive, Emma, to uh, transgender women? Um, um, maybe if you can elaborate more on that. Yeah, I think one of the big things is about signals and signs. It's about having those conversations. We all have, we're all on this amazing journey of life. We all have our own experiences that are unique to us. And within this conversation, then this is about how we make trans and non-binary people feel included. So be willing to step in and have this conversation, knowing that we're all intersectional. There's many elements to us that are fascinating. I, I'm fascinated by individuals. And I think for me, organizations that are willing, one, to step in, to make this a really inclusive conversation, and second, and thirdly, be willing to learn. This is just amazing. And I'm sure we'll talk about this as we get into the questions. But a great thing to do is to go on that learning journey for all of our experiences. You know, we all have amazing things to share. Yes, like, I mean, we all have different backgrounds, different cultures, different life experience. And then the follow up question to this, and I'll go with uh, Orla. So um, what does this idea of women supporting women mean to you? And how does it intersect your life, your culture, your gender identity, sexuality? Yeah, I think, it, you know, the core of it is inclusivity, right? At the core of it, it's supporting each other I know we talk about mentorship mentorship is one element but for me it's how then do you take that to the next level and, and sponsor each other right move each other forward in the workplace have those conversations but you know it's that in a, in your senior leadership you as a woman how can you use your political capital in an organization to help you know navigate those conversations help women help um not just even women but being you know inclusive like a lot of our policies in in our workplace you know it, it's it's everyone it's how do we educate ourselves what are the policies we now need to have in place where we're, we have that inclusive language we know what we're doing from a diversity and inclusion perspective um so you know from from the workplace it's that aspect and to me you know one of the great things is I think someone already mentioned it, it's creating space 
you know, space to have these conversations. But space in the workplace as well, in terms of, you know, making space for, for, for women to come up the, the, the rungs of the corporate ladder, right? Making sure you have that voice at the table. Now, one of the things is, you know, we as women, we don't need to find our voice. We have a voice and that's known, you know, we have that voice. So it's using it and it's being at the table, having those conversations. Um, when I look at my own personal experience and, and the intersect there, I, in my previous, so I worked with this organization before Fidelity and I wasn't out in the organization. I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't have someone to identify with. So I felt, you know, I'm, I can't identify with someone. I, I'm, I'm kind of struggling with it. And then this is going to be something different. So this is going to be me put in this different area, right? But as I became more comfortable with myself, I joined Fidelity and I could see the various leaders. So again, for me, it was visibility of other people, not just in work, but in my life that really helped me to, to be a proud gay woman and really look to right. I now have a responsibility to be seen and to advocate for others. And that's really how, you know, how I would see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe just briefly, how do you feel fidelity empower you? Um, I'm kind of curious as to um, um, the difference between your current workplace and, and the previous one. I, I think to me, it's the culture, right? It's, it starts, you know, it's, it's that global mindset of, again, diversity and inclusion, gender balance, holding ourselves accountable. So, you know, we have policies on you know gender identity expression you know someone going through through that transition as an individual what do we need to do to support them to make work easier for them as they're going through this process right emotionally physically what can we do and it goes to like your security pass you know so these things matter um we have forums across the board lgbtq plus forums there's allyship programs as well. So it, it's having all of that, right? And then you have these, you know, very visible characters in the organization. In Dublin alone, you know, there, there are so many colleagues who are out and proud and, you know, a voice and, and sit on various committees, support across the board, both internally and externally as well. So, it's, you know, it's been fantastic. And that really helped me you know, become more open as to who I was. So then, you know, it, it, it was me truly not just outside of work, but inside bringing myself to work um, fully. So, you know, my experience has been, has been great and it really did support me. Therefore, now I'm more comfortable. I can support others, you know, and I can tell my story. Yeah, well, I mean, it's always good to hear that, you know, companies are willing to create that safe environment for uh, for their employees, for um, for their community. I mean, Fidelity is just a great example of it. And all the companies on this conversation, they always do such a good job at making, making you feel comfortable to have your say and your voice on this sort of topics, which I completely admire. And maybe kind of just circling back to that same questions, I'm gonna add as much as to Farah. So I know that you have a very cool background. So if you if you can tell us what does the idea of women supporting women mean to you? And then how does, ha and how has it intersect your life? Yeah, uh, okay. I think, uh, first of all, I, I'd like to, to, to really insist on this concept that uh, women are really a, a heterogeneous, heterogeneous uh, group of people who have different lived experience that might not fully represent it in what I am going to share today. Uh, this is very important. Also, as a woman, as a lesbian from indigenous uh, uh, ethnical group uh, that, uh, that we call the Berbers, the Kabyles in from Algeria, uh, which I qualify myself again from the Arab world as well. Uh, I am speak with a very specific prism uh, induced by my own lived experience and, and again, social ethnical background. Uh, to me, what I mean by women supporting women is not an essentialist concept uh, where women, because of their supposed nature, support defined nature, which doesn't exist, should not need to support 
uh, women because of uh, or from or to support them in a specific way uh, because of who they are. It's just the simple fact of recognizing that uh, there are uh, systemic, uh, I would say, factors that uh, create inequalities. Uh, within women, uh, women community, women uh, group uh, as a, as an, I would say a social group and people, but as well uh, we have to recognize as well the the uh, the the, um, the role of, of intersectionality within that because the meaning as well uh, supporting uh, women and as well within a large uh, facets of I would say uh, uh, diversity which are. Uh, here today we are speaking about the LGBTQI community, uh, it could be as well the ethnical background, the disability ability, uh, and as well the social, the social economic background could all play a very important uh, factor or conditioning of uh, the inequalities uh, that uh, present to us. So what means to me this approach is first how we acknowledge of these inequalities, uh, we recognize them, and how we can work on a, an approach that help uh, this group of peoples to overcome the challenge and inequalities that they face. Yeah, well, I mean, I feel like it's all about having that conversation with, you know, people that are not fully aware of what's going on, you know, in, in your life, in your workplace, you know, and then by anyone in, 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 in this panel and people are attending, you know, people are curious about it. So, you know, by kind of just knowing and understanding where people come from, I feel like we can grow our like empathy about others and their challenges. So this is what this space is and people make sure to take notes, you know, to make sure that we're aware of everyone's differences. <laughs> and then um, I'm gonna ask um, Pauline, um, how, what does woman supporting woman mean to you? Um, probably very similar to what, what yeah. what's been said, but I think it's about um, all I thought about making space for women coming up through the ranks and knowing that they're supported. Absolutely. And I think that can go down to real micro points. So, for example, at meetings, we know that women are less likely to speak up. We know that women are less likely to sit at the front in meetings, just little simple facts like that. So as a woman, as a senior leader, I think we can recognise that and we can make space. We can call out when we think that someone's you know, been spoken over or that they're having their, their point missed. We can we, we know the challenges and we know what to look out for. And I think that we can we can make space in that way, too. I think we can encourage upskilling with women I think quite often in the industry there's, there's qualifications for example required for many roles and some women will shy away they don't have the time they see themselves as a perhaps a, a primary caregiver but it's working around that and acknowledging that that is a real a real challenge but how can we help how can we how can we assist and, and encourage that from um individual perspective and also mentoring I know mentoring has been mentioned but I think that uh, from a, a mentoring perspective, we can if we can put our arm around someone, some people to say, here's my story. And if you relate, let's have a conversation and we can talk about challenges and we talk and we can talk about um how, how to overcome that. But I think overall it is again to come back to the same point of it, it's about representation, it's about en encouraging women into the, the industry when they can relate to an individual. And the way that that can happen is for senior leaders to speak out, to be role models. And yes, absolutely LGBTQ community to, to be out individuals is, is great but that's it's probably just as important and absolutely critical that allies stand up as well and that will be allies for women uh, as well as the queer community to say tell me more what can I do to ask individuals who are facing these experiences because the more that we have people who are visible out having open conversations about their life and how it influences the, their work then you're more likely to have people relate who say actually put their hand up and say actually do you know what I can do that too and achieve their their highest potential. Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing when it comes to challenges, maybe if you don't mind elaborating, what would be some challenges or obstacles that LGBTQ plus women face um, in particular? Yeah, I think it's changed over the years, I would say. So when I first started in financial services uh, a long time ago, being out at work it just it just wasn't an option I didn't there's no one I could relate to so uh, I joined financial services everyone that I seen in my circle was straight talked about their um, wives husbands family it was never something that I could relate to and it was never something I felt comfortable to say actually you know I'm different I have a girlfriend I'm a lesbian well it wasn't comfortable and and when I did it was met with 
silence because people felt a bit awkward. I don't know what, how to react to that. I, I'm not sure what to say to you. Almost barriers go up because they feel like all of a sudden they can't relate in any way. And then that sort of changes over the years and it, it become, it, it, it was blatant for, for me, sexism, homophobia, any sort of discrimination over the years has changed. It used to be out there. It used to be very obvious and very visible. And it's almost gone a little bit underground and it's become whispers, which is sometimes more dangerous. So you 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 go through, you know, little comments that will say, I, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but um, you're a woman and you're a lesbian. You'll have a great chance of getting this job because you, you tick two diversity boxes. So these sort of things that are commented and said and, and, and through the years that goes from, you know, as I say, blatant to sort of more underground or, or I was only joking. And you face these as women and, and a lesbian in the workplace and it becomes more and more difficult to challenge. But I think as you mature and as you feel more comfortable in yourself and you have these role models, I'm fortunate um, with an M&G, we have amazing role models that I feel confident to speak out, the challenge to say, so what did you mean by that? And to ask questions and to do that for myself, but to also do that for, for individuals. I think everyone's experience will be different, but we will all have very similar comments, very similar um, challenges, I guess, that have, that have been made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, like, I mean, um, we have a range of different fields within this uh, uh, panel, but I'm going to ask Emma. So from the HR perspective, what are some of the um, challenges that LGBTQ plus women face or have faced or are currently facing? <laughs> oh, that's a very good question. I could speak on this for hours, but I will try and keep this really short. For sure. Uh, which is one, if we look at sort of senior leaders um, in many of the FTSE 250, you know, how many out lesbian women are there? Um, probably not that many. We still see barriers to progression. We still see some barriers. And coming back to Pauline's point, I think this is about some of the cultures that we see in some organisations that maybe aren't as inclusive as they could be, um, that actually some of the negativity goes either underground. Some of it's still very overt, I think, in many organisations. Um, I always think, and there's a really good question in the chat, which may be worth addressing at this point, which is when it comes to education learning, how can we move away from the frequent flyers who always come to something that we put on? If it's an LGBTQ event, how can we get some different people involved? And for me, this is the power of role models. This is the power of senior leaders stepping forward, encouraging those to come forward who maybe not come to that. You know, come with that open mindset. You know, I often ask senior leaders, you know, how many of you have been to a pride celebration or a pride event? You know, uh, and typically yeah. I'm I'm speaking to males. Um, um, and the show of hands is normally really small. So it's okay. We'll have the positive, cu positive curiosity. Go along. And as role models and visible role models there's a role to encourage people have those conversations to take that step on their learning to learn yes like i mean i really love that concept of positive curiosity hence why you know i as someone that identifies as a male a man you know i'm always like i need to learn I need to learn from everybody you know it's kind of like it's it's always a positive and it's always the curiosity that starts that. And and maybe I can ask Orla and Farah when it comes to data govern, um, governance and, and things like that, how do you, what are some of the challenges that you have faced? Challenges. Sorry, Farah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just asking you, Hector to repeat the question about, you mean the, the governance at uh, the workplace? Oh, oh, yeah, no, sorry. Um, my question was, um, what are some of the challenges that you have faced on your field? So it would be, um, I'm, I'm thinking I can start with you, Farah. Uh, sorry. So, yeah, uh, I think in the workplace, uh, uh, I think I, I totally agree with, 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 with what was said by uh, Emma uh, on the, the, the challenges. I think there are uh, uh, very known challenge related to the gender because this aspect is very well studied uh, uh, where there is, we have data, okay? Now, um, I guess the intersection again uh, between LGBTQI and women is very unknown or very well, uh, very, I would say, uh, and not documented as we wish. And also, I think from my own experience, because here I'm not going to speak from a, an academic point of view, uh, what I would 
I would say I share at least on my own experiences that sometimes we may face as well what we call the double standard, but not from uh, a, just a gender perspective. But in my case, because I am part of a, a minority, I would say ethnical work, uh, ethnical group, and as well, coming from Algeria where uh, LGBTQI is still uh, criminalized. Um, it's it's uh, somehow we have we have to face sometimes a potential uh, challenge in addressing these two I would say facet of uh, uh, of uh, uh, having this conversation about showing up being visible in the workplace and uh, advocating for more visibility and addressing as well the other personal challenge that you may have because of your own uh, family, surrounding circles, when you go back to your own, uh, I would say, original country where uh, LGBTQI uh, uh, aspects are still criminalized. And I think to me, as from a personal perspective, there is here some facets that are not necessarily well known in the Western world when addressing this question of LGBTQI uh, in the workplace where we want to make them visible, to address them properly from various prisms, uh, not only the Westerner prism. And I, I am privileged in a certain way because I work in HSBC. In HBC, we have a, a very significant footprint in Asia where we have as well very large uh, ethnical groups. Uh, I think it's one of the biggest, I think, group in terms of a variety of, uh, of ethnical uh, uh, background. And I think we have this at least uh, area of attention that we want to integrate as much uh, the yeah the lived experience of the variety of ethnic groups that we uh, we have in our yeah workplace. Awesome, thank you, Farah. Um, and then Orla, when it comes to being a director of a theater governance, um, what are some of the challenges that you have faced? You know, I'm guessing when it comes to um, who is making those bigger decisions, are they um, any challenges in there? Bigger decisions in what regard? Sorry, um, I'm, I'm sorry, like in data govern data governance, I feel like uh, when it comes to deciding which data is approved or not, has there been any challenges when in 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 your role as a woman in your company? I, I think the, the challenge is always having the conversation and being at the right table, right? Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, and, and navigating that not only as a woman, but as a gay woman. So you know, in in terms of, I suppose, past experiences, I've been told I've been too direct at times, right? And I'm like, interesting, is this, I see Pauline laughing, um, is this, you know, the, are my male colleagues being asked and being pulled up about being too direct, um, you know, or you're sitting in a, in a meeting and, you know, there's, there's a good few men around the table and they look to you to take the minutes. And I'm like, hold on a second, you know, I'm, you know, uh, you guys are well capable of writing as well. Um, so it, it, it's those, you know, the navigation of that as, as a woman in, in the workplace and, and pushing away from those, you know, societal norms of the past, right? Um, and breaking the the term I, I would love to, to get rid of is the, um, the, the glass ceiling, right? we should not have that you know we should be empowering pushing um so what if i'm direct um you know i you you may see me as direct but again it, it's you know perception it's it's holding people accountable and asking them i've asked for examples you know show me how i have been direct um you know so it's pushing it standing up having that voice um Various other challenges. I know it's not my own personal experience, but but having your work um, quoted um, through a, a different voice. So someone stepping in and, you know, you've done all this work, you've put it all together. And then now I know this is not all men, um, but your male colleague uh, comes along and has the same conversation with the same person. And they're like, oh, that's a great idea. Well done. Um, you know, you've put in that work. So again, it, it, it's as women, if we see this happening, challenging it, you know, it, it's not acceptable. Um, and, and that's, you know, I, I will continue to do that. Um, I've, I've never been 
I, I think a shy wallflower. So that's kind of helped as well. Um, but again, it's, you know, empowering those other women around us to, to have those same conversations and challenge the, the behaviors as well as we see them call it out, educate um, to, to Emma's point as well in terms of, you know, educating understanding as well so it's okay not to understand but if you educate yourself then you know brilliant um and, and acknowledging that you don't understand as well I think you know that that really brings you into the conversation that you're open to hearing those diverse voices um and you know openness as well from um besides challenging that that um, narrative what you experience when you have that awkward conversation um what other initiatives from your perspective can help pass that awkwardness of like hey i've been challenged i want to move past this because maybe some of our viewers might be like i want to have this conversation but i feel personally attacked so how do you go about that i think for me it, it's finding your your support nucleus in, in, in or outside the organization, right? And I have a great set of friends from all backgrounds. Um, and, and that, you, you know, in terms of, you know, you, you're, you're straight women, you're gay women, you're, you know, your you're queer community, my brother's gay. Um, so that really, you know, having that support really helps me and really, you know, sounding out various things with them because, you know, at the point of a challenge, you, you'll take a step back and I know as, my personal thing I was kind of taken aback going or is this really happening to me why am I being called out for, for this you know um and taking a breath and then finding someone you know in the workplace that you're comfortable with in having that conversation as well and not being afraid to have the conversation either you know um and then well I mean I'm gonna. I'm looking at some of the questions that connect with your points. So I'm guessing for the other panelists, I'm gonna go with um, Pauline. So, um, what are some good resources for starting this conversations? Maybe you can provide an example that MNG has done that you're like that works. Yeah, I, I think uh, our pride um, committee. So our pride um, community and and um, and M MNG, we have a. Um, post where we update but we also ask others to join as allies so we have an allyship program for example where we'll have an open conversation on the challenges that lgbtq plus people face in the workplace um, and we'll talk about what can be done to support and as i said it's not just about calling out when you hear something that's you know obviously inappropriate but it's about education and it's about looking asking questions to those who have who have faced issues and if you've got no one in the workplace or no one that you know socially then there's hundreds, thousands of online resources where you can Google practically anything, but where you can just get some some tips and some some reasons why, I suppose, some reasons why your support as an ally is really critical and specifically, you know, what what you can do. And that is that creating space piece, not, not, not making assumptions, asking more questions is the best way to educate yourself from people across the community. Yeah. And um I'm going to go with Emma. So Emma, in Global Butterflies, how do you approach topics like this with uh, with 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 clients? Um, it's like, I want to talk about this without, you know, um, making them feel left out or feel like, you know, they are the problem. <laughs> I think I come back exactly to yeah. what Pauline's just said. Yeah. A really great way to engage in any conversation is to ask questions. Go on your learning journey understand that your experience is not like everybody else you know our our life journeys are unique to us um so absolutely be willing to step in step we call it step in and step up um you know because absolutely the power of allies the power of supporting others is hugely impactful but be willing to have a conversation and if you're worried about conversations ask for forgiveness before you start a conversation you know, I'm still learning about this subject. I might get things wrong, but I really want to learn. So help me. And I think for me, this is coming back to what both Pauline and Aura have talked about, which is great leaders show that vulnerability and humility, humility. They understand that other people's perspectives are different. And that's a really great thing to do is to step in just to learn. 
because you know I'm always learning I'm learning about so much and I think it's just a it's just enriching and uplifting okay no thank you um we just have just a couple of minutes I'm just going to go straight to the Q&A um, um section so um this is kind of from our perspective with running in person events and webinars we notice that most of the people that go in person are uh, men um, maybe my question to the panel is like, um, how can we promote networking and collaboration among women in different industries? Uh, I can start with you, Farah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, thank you, because I wanted to share at least one experience that I have been practicing, and I think um, practice is a good way to, as well, share experience. Um, I think uh, uh, there are a lot of, of course, um, I would say, conversation about uh, whether networking work for women, and you can see that not often the case, okay? What I try to do in, uh, for example, uh, with uh, my local team, when I say uh, the, the investment team, working in France, for example, but because you have to start really with small uh, community or small groups, is I, I, I try to create a group of women working in investment, so we're really all investment professional, where we, from time to time, we, uh, we create a circle of, uh, I would say, a safe circle of conversation. So we meet, we have, uh, sometimes we have drinks, sometimes we adapt as well because uh, we have sometimes uh, caring moms who cannot maybe take drinks, etc. So we adapt in a way that we can have moments for conversation. And I would say uh, creating this community that uh, connect, discuss, topics related to our own lived experience. And what this, this creates is a sense of belonging and community that help each other, and not necessarily through a kind of networking that is generally more thought from a male perspective. And it created, to some extent, I was so very surprised by the very positive uh, implication of this circle or safe circle community that we have created and then says that even if we were not always connecting all together at the same time simultaneously, this circle created a lot of connectivity between the women expert in the investment team and somehow whenever we wanted to have, I don't know, a matter of expertise where instead of looking for a male colleague who uh, would be qualified as the expert, uh, we were more uh, addressing our questions or interaction to the women of the circle. And this made it possible to make visible women's work. Because what I think Ola shared at the beginning about her experience about uh, making invisible some uh, women in work is uh, very, I mean, uh, common in, the, in, the, in male dominated industries. And I think it was very effective in that regard. And of course, there were many other facets that were positive from this uh, niche community aspect practice. Um, no, awesome. You yeah, know, it's all about, you know, supporting each other. Um, exactly. Um, um, anyone else on the panel as a last question or, uh, or, or, or would like to answer this last question before we end up the session? I hear lots of yeses. <laughs> no, well, I'm guessing um, I do have one last question and just we're running just a few minutes over, but I'm going to just say it and then hopefully one of you might be able to answer. So a question is, as a woman, a frequent issue is being spoken to in a condescending or patronizing manner by others who assume you are a junior. Any practical tips slash helpful comebacks that you have found helpful in these scenarios? It's an interesting one. Um, yeah. yeah, and a, and a, a resume. I think it would be unique to the, the situation, um, but ultimately, I think the question would probably be, depending on what the assumption is, but, you know, what makes you think that? What makes you think? Asking that person who's assumed, what makes you think? What makes you assume I am whatever it is they have assumed you are? Because I think asking an open question, it sometimes causes them to, to sort of stumble and the obvious answer is because you're a woman and they just assumed that you would get the coffee take the notes whatever, whatever it might be um you know asking what what makes you think that what makes you assume can often you know an open question will give at least get an answer will it be honest you know it's probably won't happen again so no well i mean uh thank you uh uh 
everyone for joining. Um, Pauline, Orla, Farah, Emma, thank you very much for your contribution to this conversation. What you have uh, um, spoken today, hopefully it resonates and helps um, other women in the same situation and allies as well. Allies, do your work. <laughs> um, um, uh, I wanted to empower the LGBTQ plus community. And um, um, if anyone has questions or would like to connect with any of our panelists, feel free to reach us out. Um, um, I'm sure that they might be able to share some of the expertise or um, uh, with you. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you again for ev uh, for everyone tuning in. Um, just to let you know, uh, this wraps up the webinar. And if any of you are are interested or really like this webinar, um, our next event is Idaho uh, Together Always uh, United in Diversity on May 17th. So just stay tuned. I'm going to leave this presentation on just for a couple of minutes if you want to skew it on the QR code. And once again, uh, panelists, thank you very much for your time and hope you got a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.